uh, let's go over to Yang. Okay, so thanks, David. Okay, so uh, for students, welcome back to my third lecture, the module and the CCG. So I just uh, saw the result of the pool. So it's uh, quite clear uh, that it seems that uh, uh, the progress of my project is not so significant. Okay. So the issue is uh, so first that this um, algebraic geometry or computational algebraic geometry is a uh, quite a tough subject. And my lecture is uh, very dense. And especially if you really want to make some significant progress on this project, you need this third lecture. So the third lecture about the module and the thesis would be the most uh, uh, physics physical uh, lecture in my series. Okay, so I start. So in theoretical physics, so many cases we have linear equations and uh, sometimes we want the solutions to be special. A special means sometimes we want the, spe the uh, solution contain only polynomials. But if we treat this kind of linear equations by Gaussian elimination in linear algebra, then we find that usually the linear solutions contain rational functions, contain some poles we don't want. We just want linear solutions in polynomials only. So in this case, we are not working with the linear algebra. We are using algebra geometry. So the two is called the module and the CCG. So the first the CCG example, this one is very, very close to our project. So uh, this is from this uh, classic paper uh, from David Goswell and his uh, colleagues about 10 years ago. So this is about the IPP reduction for multi-loop uh, Feynman integrals. So IPP computation is uh, really, really important for multi-loop computation and also it's a bottleneck. It's quite, quite difficult. So you can see here, so you have some kind of Feynman integral. So by this kind of dimensional regularization, and if you take this total derivative, you can assume there's no boundary term and the integration is just a zero. But if you expand this formula, uh, you will get a lot of uh, different Feynman integrals. Then that just mean, okay, a linear combination of several Feynman integral is zero. So that's called IPP relation. So why is it difficult? Difficult is uh, this vector, you have a lot of freedom in choosing this vector. That means you get a huge number of uh, IBPs. Also you have some freedom to choose this alpha one, this kind of uh, denominator factors. So basically you could easily have um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of million uh, IBP equations for a working problem. And in that case, if you really try to somehow solve this kind of linear relations to reduce, all integrals to the so-called mass integrals, they need to a, a huge matrix Gaussian elimination. It's not so easy. So uh, from this paper, that's the new idea to use CCG to control what kind of vector should we use. So the issue is uh, if you naively just take this total derivative, then you find that uh, on this denominator like D1, R for one, if you take a derivative, then uh, naturally you will get something like still d1, but uh, the power will be alpha one plus one. So you have a, a higher order pole okay, in this integrand. And then basically you spend most of the time doing this kind of uh, Gaussian elimination on the so-called Laporte algorithm, get rid of this kind of integrals, because uh, in most the cases, the physical integrals they have this kind of denominator uh, indices either one or zero, or at most the two or something like that. But just by taking the derivative, you don't have any control of this uh, degree. Then you have a lot of unphysical integrals. If you try to do Gaussian elimination on it, it will be a disaster. So here is a smart way of choosing this kind of VI. So how do we do this? We have this kind of VI and uh, if you take the derivative of d1, you get an increase of the degree of d1. But then you assume that you take a, a, this kind of a derivative of this kind of d, and uh, you try to impose a condition. This derivative is again proportional to the same d. So this kind of derivative will provide another factor of d. So this d will cancel this alpha plus one. Okay. By doing this, you don't have the increase of the denominator power. Then you have a control of the denominator degree. Then you don't have so many targeted integrals. 
in your computation in the Napata algorithm, this can dramatically shrink the IPP system, reduce the number of integrals uh, in the Laporta process and makes things a lot easier. However, if you really try to solve this equation, of course, it's a linear equation. You have this kind of unknown, this vector V mu here, and this kind of D, of course, D is given, D is given. You have some GI, this is a cofactor you don't know you want to solve for. But if you really treat V and G as some kind of variables, and then if you solve it by linear algebra, get some solutions. But these solutions, again, can have some kind of pose in this loop of momentum. So in this case, although you solve this equation, you introduce the other kind of pose. And this pose will again destroy this kind of algorithm because then you are introducing new kind of pose. You are going to a different integral family or somehow simply you say, okay, I introduce another pole, then again, this uh, pole, this uh, pole uh, degree is increasing, that's not good. So we want this kind of V and G, the polynomials of uh, loop momentum L1 to LL. But to solve this kind of linear equation and require the results should only be polynomials, it's not a, a linear algebra problem, the CCG problem. Okay. So a slightly different case is, suppose you work with some kind of representation of a Feynman integral. So here we choose a simple one. So this is a so-called Niepuranski representation. This is introduced in Romani's paper about six years ago. So the thing here is you have a um, integral representation. It's a very, very similar to the Feynman parameterization, but the difference is instead we have um, two symmetric polynomials. So here we only have one polynomial, Nipporensky polynomial. The power is simple here. And this integration actually is from zero to infinity. So from this kind of representation for different power, so previously you have this kind of a, a power, this alpha one, alpha k. So here you can say, I put this kind of alpha as a, this monomial power in the representation. Then the question is, Suppose I want to find the IPP relation, and it means with a different alpha, I try to find some kind of relation between the integrals. So again, if you take a, some kind of a naive total derivative, and suppose you forget about this kind of boundary term, actually there is a long zero boundary term, but boundary term are under control because they are lower sector integrals. Don't even worry about that. Um, if you take the total derivative and drop this kind of lower sector integrals, then you see, okay, take the derivative. So it's a Q is uh, again, some kind of function of Z you want to add here. So if you take this derivative uh, on Q, then this seems quite normal. This one is still a polynomial. And this is a kernel. So this one is still a Niepman-Ransky representation. But the second term, if you take the derivative on the G here, then the power is changed. So you get a, uh, uh, some some kind of power like this. So in this case, you find that uh, actually, so instead of uh, uh, getting some kind of uh, Nipporan-Ransky IBP with the same dimension D, you get a different dimensions. That's a bad situation, that's a bad situation. That just means somehow you are missing the IBP relation and the dimension shift identity. Okay, that's not good. That will make this an apart algorithm even harder to solve. So again, you can say, I want this Q to be some special polynomials. They satisfy this equation, okay? So if we want this QI dot this G first derivatives, okay? Is a proportion to G. So although it seems as bad as the dimension is shifted, but somehow if this derivative itself is proportional to G, and then, okay, this shift is removed. So again, I get everything in the same dimension. So it's still a good IPP uh, relation. So in that kind of requirement, we need this Q and this H to be polynomials of this kind of Z variables. So that means uh, we take this kind of IPP, but we want some kind of good IPP. So we can put some kind of CCG constraint on the Q and of course some call factor is H. So so here the situation is so we have some kind of a linear equation like this one, like this one. It looks quite a linear equation, but we want the solution to be polynomial in some kind of variables. So this is a CCG problem. 
Okay, so I have to turn to mathematics. So I apologize that uh, again, I have to turn to something quite formal. Okay, something very mathematical. But if you don't understand it completely, it's okay. Okay, because uh, we have this kind of software. Software can do everything for you. So here we have to extend our uh, this uh, our concept of the idea a little bit. So idea is like we are doing some kind of one dimensional problem. We are always working with one point lambda, one point lambda like this. But here we have a vector of point lambdas. So this kind of generalization is called module. So our module M over point lambda ring is very, very similar to a linear space. So you can say, okay, so over this point lambda ring, so you can say if I take two elements from this module M1 and M2, Okay, multi, multiplied by f, f is some kind of poly polynomial. I'm sorry, it should be f, this should be f here, not a and b, f, m1 and f, m2. Okay, and if you take the, uh, the sum of two polynomials uh, multiplied by this m, then you can see this split into this kind of sum. And also this multiplication is associated. And if you have this kind of uh, unit polynomial one, so multiplied by any kind of element is a module itself. So this one is very, very similar to the definition of uh, um, the linear space in linear algebra. But what's the difference? The difference is here, this is a ring. This is not a field. So if you work with this kind of uh, module, uh, actually the situation is uh, uh, it's very similar to the linear space, but you don't have the freedom to divide by the polynomial. So in linear algebra, if you have a vector, you have the freedom to divide it by any kind of non-zero number, it's okay, it's still a vector, normalized vector. But uh, uh, in module, you can say, you cannot divide by uh, any kind of arbitrary non-zero polynomial, so there's a big difference. So right now we are working with this kind of module, but right now you can just think that, okay, it's some kind of a linear space not as flexible as a real linear space. So here you see, sometimes we have a basis of a module that is we have this kind of generating set M1 to Mk. And you find that if you put some kind of factors F1, M1 plus dot 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 plus this Fk, Mk equals zero, that implies that all this kind of coefficient polynomials equals zero. So that's just uh, everything is similar to the definition of linear algebra. But then the difference is uh, in linear algebra, okay, uh, for any kind of uh, linear space, you can always find a basis. But uh, for module, actually, in most cases, you actually don't find a basis. That means you can still get a generating set, a finite generating set. But the bad thing is uh, you always find some kind of long trivial relations like this, and uh, this kind of f, they are not zero. So that means uh, you find the generating set of the generators, you cannot choose to be completely independent. So that's a difference between linear space and the module. But in some case, if a module contains a uh, contains a basis, then it's called a free module, the trivial module. The everything is similar to linear algebra. So here, let's talk about the CCG. So why do we introduce this kind of module? So the thing is we try to use CCG. So here we say, if we have this kind of M1, Mk, so k elements in a module, M over a polynomial ring, then we can see this kind of equation, this kind of linear combination, this kind of f, so one to fk, each f is a polynomial, the sum to zero. So this kind of set, this f1 to fk, all these kind of triplets, uh, they form a sausage of m1 to mk. So basically, basically we have this kind of m1 to mk, they are fixed. Then we try to find this kind of a solution of this kind of linear equation in this f1 to fk. And we require all this f1 to fk must be polynomials, cannot be fractions. So this solution set is called the CCG. Then clearly CCG actually is a module and the CCG is a sub-module of this free module RK. Or if we put it to the linear algebra language, so this one is uh, actually is a little bit confusing because we have M1 to Mk here. So if you say this M1 itself is a vector, okay, so you can think that this uh, 
M is uh, somehow a sub-module of R, L. That means each M1 actually is a vector uh, and it's a column vector of uh, L elements and each element is a polynomial. Then you can write this uh, M1 to Mk as a L times K matrix, okay? Because we have uh, L rows and K columns. So this one is a matrix, not a square matrix, just a matrix. Then I can say, we try to solve this equation. That means we try to find the kernel of this long space of this matrix. And then we say, roughly speaking, we want this, uh, uh, this long space of this kind of, any kind of this kind of F to be polynomial. So we say it's a kernel A intersects with RK. So this is a, a definition. Roughly speaking, it's very, very similar to linear algebra, but then we have this kind of intersection. Uh, you have to be careful here because uh, right now this notation, so each uh, each element is mi is a column vector. So this is the standard notation from com this, uh, uh, computational algebra geometry textbook. So if you use some kind of software or if you read uh, some papers in the literature, it could be transposed. It could be each row is a generator, okay? But here, okay, from mathematical uh, convention, that's each column is a vector. Each column is this mi, which is a generator of this uh, sub-module. Okay, suppose we can find this situation. This situation again is a sub-module of Rk. The thing is, uh, usually this uh, situation is not so simple. You can find a finite generating set for this situation. Uh, but the bad thing is, the very bad thing here is this CCG is not a free module. So uh, although you can find a generating set, but uh, there's no way to get an independent generating set. Okay, but anyway, so right now the goal is just uh, to find some kind of generating set instead of the basis. Okay. So here we need to do some kind of computation in the module. Uh, in the module, everything is very, very similar to the polynomial case or the polynomial ideal case. So say, let's say we consider this kind of uh, uh, RL. This RL is a free module, which is L copy of this polynomial ring. Suppose we have A1 to AL, this uh, L polynomials. Uh, we want to rewrite this kind of module elements as a vector. So this E1 to EL, they are just the unit of vectors, okay, like in the Euclidean geometry, but this E1 to EL actually just uh, tells the direction it itself has no meaning, okay, just this uh, orientation, this direction. This A1, AL, they are polynomial. So formally, it seems that this one is a polynomial valued vector okay, in the Euclidean space. So for this kind of element in a module, we try to find uh, a monomial ordering for it. Then we can do some kind of polynomial division over the module. And then we can also do this kind of group of basis computational algebra geometry over this module. So it's quite obvious. So how do you define this kind of monomial ordering for, uh, for the module? The thing is, uh, so what is monomial for this case? The monomial, we use is actually just a one monomial times any kind of unit vector, any direction. So here, okay, we have this kind of monomial. We have basically two kinds of extension of the polynomial ordering. Okay, so we have this kind of module ordering. So one thing is the term over position. Now we have two monomials. They both contain some kind of unit vector. But forget about the unit vector. Let's compare the two monomials first. If this AI is bigger than, higher than this AJ, okay, then we just write this left is higher than right. But if there's a tile between these two monomials, then we compare these two unit vectors. So we just compare this kind of direction. So if this uh, I, is larger than G, then we say, okay, uh, this whole thing is higher than that. So we compare the monomial first and then we compare the unit direction. 
But we can also consider something else. We can consider the position over the term. Let's forget about this kind of AI AG for a while. Let's compare these two unit vector directions. Okay, if only if there are the same directions, then we do this kind of monomial uh, auto comparison. So that's a basically two kind of philosophy in treating this kind of monomial algorithm. So clearly, the uh, the purpose is here. If you really use this kind of TOP, the term over position, then somehow you are really focusing on the uh, polynomials. You try to say, I try to sort this kind of polynomials first and then consider the orientation. But this one is more like I consider the orientation first. I, for example, if you, you want to do a group basis, some elimination, I always try to get rid of uh, uh, some of the direction, get rid of some of the unit vector, and then I consider the polynomial problem. I can do both. So again, okay, I just try to repeat everything quickly. So just like the idea, okay, so for the ideal case, if you try to do this kind of ideal membership problem, if you try to compare two ideas, it's better compute the group basis. For this kind of sub-modules of RL, you can also do the group basis because uh, here I already defined this kind of monomial ordering for the sub-module. So seeing is everything is just the same. Okay, you can do this kind of polynomial division. You can also do this kind of book book algorithm like this. So the book book algorithm, the heart of the uh, book book algorithm is that you can do this kind of S pair given these two elements, M1, M2, you can cancel the leading term like this. So here, the everything just the same as ideal, because ideal is just like the one dimensional linear algebra. But right now we are doing L dimensional uh, linear algebra, that's analog. So for this multi-dimensional case, you can still define this kind of list uh, common multiplier, LCM, and uh, you can see by doing this, it's canceled out. But you only need to worry about if this M1, M2, okay, the leading term contains different unit vectors, then you can see we just simply define the LCM of the two leading terms just to zero. But doing this, you can see, okay, then I can define what is S pair, I can do what is the leading term, and then I can do the polynomial division on this kind of vectors. So immediately, if you can do the group basis of a module, then you can solve this uh, sub-module idea membership, uh, this kind of uh, sub-module idea, this sub-module membership problem. That means you have this kind of sub-module, and then I give you one vector. This vector, everything is in polynomial. You want to decide if this vector is in this module or not. So this one is not a linear algebra problem, but if you can calculate the group basis of the module, divide the vector by the group basis, then uh, try to say if the remainder is zero or not, then you get the result. So similarly, if you try to compare two sub-modules, then you can just say I calculate the group basis with the same ordering. If we uh, get this kind of uh, same group basis, then we just conclude that the two uh, modules are the same. Okay, so here. That is the abstract part in mathematics. Let's turn to something calculable. So let's talk about the global basis of our module. So the current version of mathematics doesn't do this kind of computation. So again, we use this kind of singular uh, interface in mathematics to do this. It's quite convenient. But uh, you have to be very, very careful here, okay? Because the convention, there's some convention problem. So uh, I said that, when we do this kind of computation, we always can consider okay, um, this, this kind of sub-module in some kind of free module. So here we can see if we have several elements, then each element is a vector and each component of the vector is a polynomial. So the whole thing is a matrix. But uh, unfortunately, somehow uh, in mathematics, especially in, the, in this interface, the matrix is actually really transposed, so be careful here. So here we write this kind of uh, three times two matrix. And uh, in the interface, the so understanding you can see actually each row is an element in the module. <laughs> so 
uh, in the literature is always each column and in the singular it's always each column, but in mathematics also, because uh, mathematics seems like it's a list for language. So this matrix is a list of lists. So the every row actually is a, is an element in the module. So actually we are talking about three elements. Each row is an element in this module, which is a double copy of the polynomial ring. But uh, if you get familiar with that, it's okay. okay. So each row in mathematics is an uh, element of the module, not a column. So you just uh, load this kind of uh, interface and then you can call something like singular STD, standard basis, or singular slim GB to do this kind of group basis for the sub module. So you just put this M into the input tell this interface you are working with A, B, C, D like this. And then this kind of monomial order. Uh, so here, okay, you have some kind of complicated ordering. The first one is uh, TOP, term over position, write this kind of uh, term ordering, term ordering, I say it's a DRL ordering, degree reverse nexographic ordering. And uh, the second item here, this uh, module deciding is really, um, the sorting between the different unit of vectors. So here you see we have like R2, this double copy of the polynomial ring. So we have two directions. So this kind of uh, D setting really means E1 is higher than E2. Okay, but of course you can change it. You can change it to X setting. That means this uh, E2 is higher than E1. So you have a lot of freedom. You can do another kind of computation that is a position over a term. So the first thing to have that compile this uh, orientation first. So E1 is higher than E2, but forget what is in front of E1. But suppose that you have two uh, module elements with the same direction, then it compares the term. So it's a position over a term. All this kind of computation can be done very, very quickly. But the thing is you can say, it's clearly, okay, if you do this POT, position over term, the result is much, much longer, and this one result is shorter. So that's a lesson. If you do this kind of group basis computation of a module, if you do it with POT, actually it's a very heavy computation, because the thing is you really try to, by brute force, get rid of some components uh, in one direction. So here I can say this is a module, uh, deciding, which means E1 is really higher than E2. So the program will use group basis, try the best, try to get rid of anything with E1. So you can see, you get three vectors. This E1 components, they are all zero. So somehow it's successful, but the cost is, since it's a brute force, you get rid of this E1 components and the cost is this E2 components getting very complicated. But sometimes it's very useful because it, for example, if you really want to get rid of this kind of event components, then you have to do this kind of ordering. But in general, it's a very heavy computation. Okay. So this is uh, um, this is the group basis computation of the module. So you can say this one is really just a generalization of the ideal case. So for the ideal case, you can say you can forget about this second column. You can say I have three. Uh, polynomials, I try to get uh, the group basis of it. And that's a very uh, simple question you can do. But uh, here you can say each, actually each row is an element. So basically you are working like not just uh, this kind of polynomial division, one polynomial divided by another polynomial. Actually it's a one vector divided by another vector. So this is a group basis. So previously, if you really try to do the group basis or computation algebra geometry with the module, it's quite difficult. But uh, in recent years, actually Singular already improved a lot with this kind of uh, group basis computation of the modules. So you can try that, getting much, much better. So of course, if you are working with the Maple, then I think this uh, module computation with group basis is already embedded in Maple. So it's more advanced for that kind of direction in Maple. Okay, so let's talk about the technical part. So this one is quite difficult to understand. So you calculate this kind of a group basis uh, of the module, but still it's not something that useful because in most cases you really don't want to really say, I have two more sub-modules, I try to calculate group basis, I try to compare them. 
uh, is a, not a such a popular problem, but something popular is this kind of CCG computation as something very, very important. So let's say we have this kind of uh, um, a finite uh, set of uh, some uh, module elements. Actually, each M is actually a, a vector. Uh, Sorry, it's a little bit confusing here because in the literature, so it's always a it's always a column vector. Only in mathematics, it's a row vector. So let's back to mathematics. So you can think this M one is actually is a column vector instead of a row vector. So to get the CCG generator, this one can be done by the Schrein, the famous Schrein algorithm. So Schreier algorithm tells that you can get the CCG from the Google basis. So the thing here is, uh, let's say, suppose, okay, you are talking about the generating set, this M1 to MS is already a global basis. So this uh, input vectors are already group basis. Of course, it's very, very special. Then the situation is very simple. You can say, I again calculated the S pair, this kind of, uh, LCM here divided by the leading term do this kind of subtraction. But uh, if you do this, the result is uh, after you cancel this MIJ and the leading term, something actually really divide the out. So it looks like a fraction, but actually not a fraction. It's really a vector with uh, polynomial entries. So this one should be by the polynomial division over a group basis. Again, be some kind of polynomials multiplied by the group basis elements. I can see this is M, this is MJ, there's some MK here. They are all elements in this set. So it's a, it itself is a CCG relation. Or formally you can say, okay, I say I find the one CCG generator, which is SIJ. This MI, I call it is a VI direction. VI is some kind of abstract ice, unit of vector in ice. And this MJ, I just say it's one direction, it's MK some direction. So this SIJ is uh, again a vector. So what we did, what we did here is, uh, right now we try to see. You see, we we I just uh, said that from the S pair of the global basis elements we get a CCG relation. But the Schreier algorithm tells that all such kind of SIJ um, generates the whole CCG set. Okay, that's a very important theorem. So remember this SIG itself okay, is not a matrix, it's a vector, I'm sorry. So it's really like a, a, this kind of a polynomial version of a linear algebra. And just like a linear algebra, you have to be very, very careful with the left multiplication, right multiplication, matrix, the transpose of matrix, the indices are very important. So here this SIG mean, this IG means I use MI and MJ to generate this CCG relations itself actually is again a vector. This SIJ is not a matrix, okay. So if you have a group of basis, if you want this kind of relations between the group of basis generators, actually you are done. But the situation is in physics, in any kind of real problems, and we are not working with the, the, this kind of linear relations between M1 to MS. So let's turn to the real world. So real world is, uh, if you have this F1 to FK, I'm sorry, it's F1 to FK, they are not, they are not polynomials. Actually, they are um, actually this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, module elements. So this is not a group basis. So we can always calculate the group basis. So we have this F1 to FK, we can calculate the group basis, which is this kind of M, and this F must be, uh, be expanded by the group of basis, okay, like this. But since the group of basis and the F, they generate the same kind of some modules, so there must be another kind of matrix, B matrix. Note that in most cases, A matrix and B matrix are not square matrix. So uh, you have to be careful with the dimensions of the matrices. So again, this kind of A, it itself is a matrix, it's a K, okay, it's a K, it's the number of F. This F, this S, that's the number of the uh, group of basis entries. So this is a K times S matrix, it's a S times K matrix. The thing is uh, actually all these kind of matrix, they contains only 
uh, polynomial entries, you, you should not use any kind of fraction in this A and B here, okay, so because we are working with the algebra geometry, so it's not a linear algebra. So the second Schweiger algorithm okay, tells you that the CCG of this generating set actually is, gen is uh, this A times SIJ. So remember the A is a matrix, this SIJ is a set. This is a not a matrix, this SIJ is a, the vector generated by the S pair of I and J. So this whole thing here, okay, is legal. So it's a, a matrix times a vector. And uh, again, you can say, if you start, okay, if you start with uh, uh, this kind of uh, F and then you change it to the M and then you change it back to this F, you get some kind of a long trivial relations So this, uh, I subtract B A give you another kind of uh, another kind of a relation. Okay, for the for the F uh, generating set. So combine these two things together is S pair and uh, this kind of thing. Actually, you get all these kind of uh, CCGs. But uh, you don't need to remember so how do you really get the CCG. So it's already somehow uh, in the interface to the singular. And I'm sure that what I said, this is uh, the first algorithm get the, the CCG is not the best algorithm. So that's a very, one very important thing here. So you can see here I get uh, by whatever algorithm, this kind of uh, SIG or this kind of A, SIG, I subtract the B, all these kind of things. But uh, the important thing is that you get this kind of generating set, but uh, does the generating set is itself a group basis of this CCG? So that's a very good question. Actually, it is, but it is not the normal group basis we are talking about. It definitely is not this kind of term over position, or position over term ordering. So it's a special weighted ordering, depends on the original F, depends on the original degree of the M. So the self is again a group of basis, but it's a group of basis in the weighted ordering. So in many cases, although you have this kind of generic set, you know it's a group of basis, but still you want to calculate the group of basis with some kind of normal ordering. Okay, okay. check this using algebra geometry book, the section 5.3 for this. So again, here you can do this kind of CCG computation with in mathematics by the interface. Now you have this kind of, uh, still this trivial example, you have, uh, okay, each show is a generator. Okay, so you have three generators. I want to find the relation between the three generators. Okay, it's quite possible if you find no relation between the three generators, it's quite okay. But here, you can see we call singular to do this. Okay, and the singular really find the relation for you actually as, uh, you can see you get uh, actually just the one vector. This one vector has three components. So what's the meaning of that? So that is the CCG module is generated by only one CCG relation. And this thing here multiplied this matrix from left actually. So this vector, this uh, uh, three component vector times is three times two matrix, you should get a zero, okay. So it's very similar to say, I take the long space of the matrix from left, okay. But the thing is, if you use a linear algebra, then you find the solution will be some kind of fractions. They are not, uh, they are not polynomial uh, valued vectors, so not something so useful. But this singular S Y Z singular CCG really give you a very good linear solution, linear solutions for the homogeneous equation system. So I just uh, try to emphasize to here again. So this one is different from the most of the literature. So here we use each row is the generator. And here when we take the long space, we are taking the long space from the left. So it's different from the convention. Okay, that's a mathematical convention. So the CCG computation is again, okay, can be a quite a heavy computation because if you want to get a CCG, you have to get the group basis of the sub module first, because the, this kind of module group basic computation could be heavy. But uh, for physics problem, actually we 
in most of the cases, we don't want all the generators. And in some very particular cases, we just need one CCG relation. So in this case, you can put something called a degree bound option in singular. That means uh, for the singular computation, if you say for the intermediate step, the degree power is higher than some number, say higher than six, higher than seven, and stop. Because in this case, you can definitely uh, stop the computation and just get some partial results. Possibly you don't get all the synergy relation, get some of it, but they are low degree ones. Because in physics problem, in most of the cases, you only need the load and polynomial degree one uh, relation, the CCG. You don't need this kind of high degree ones. This kind of mysterious. But uh, in practice, if you can put the degree bound to truncate the computation in the middle way, it can speed up things quite a lot. Okay, I think we should have a stop for five minutes and then we come back. Okay. Uh, uh, Lucy, so what is the standard time right now on your side? So I think for the rest part, it will be quite, quite physical, nothing so mathematical. Let's talk about this kind of CCG computation. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So uh, we should remember one thing. So here uh, I introduce this kind of computational algebra geometry from this kind of historic development. So first, uh, Bocherberg developed the global basis and then Schreiber using the global basis uh, develop the first algorithm of getting CCG. But nowadays you can see is somehow this uh, concept of CCG and a group basis is, uh, is getting mixed because in some kind of a new algorithm, they are really using CCG, or at least this kind of partial information of CCG to calculate group basis in a reversed way. So Let's say some application of the CCG. So that's why it's the first very, very simple question. You can see the intersection. So previously we said that we can do this kind of intersection with the computational algebra geometry uh, by the global basis computation with the elimination um, ordering. So here, there's a better algorithm to do this kind of intersection than to uh, even broader class of problems. Let's talk about the intersection of the two modules. Of course, the ideas are also modules. So this one can also the intersection of the two ideas. So the thing here is suppose you have a two uh, generating set F1, Fs, that's G1 to GT. You find, you try to find the intersection of the two sub modules. So in the linear algebra analog, that means you have this kind of a linear subspace, another linear subspace, okay. You try to, to find this kind of uh, uh, intersection here. So the way you want to do it is uh, actually do this kind of uh, CCG computation. You try to find the CCG solution like this alpha one to alpha s plus beta one to beta t here, then make sure that the whole thing, okay, take the sum equal to zero. So this is definitely a CCG relation. But if you read this kind of CCG relation from the halfway, you take the first half from alpha one to alpha s. So definitely this element may not be zero and it's inside this M1. But you can say this one equals something beta one plus uh, beta t, so this part is also in the second module. So actually this first half, this alpha one plus something to alpha s is both in this M1 and M2. So it's in the intersection of M1 and M2. So you can say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the intersection relation and also the CCG relation. So if you can calculate the CCG uh, of all these kind of generators, you already get the intersection. This is a much better way to do this than to do the intersection with the elimination theory because by doing the other way, you have to introduce the auxiliary variable T here. And then you also increase the total degree of the polynomials makes the computation much, much slower. So this one is better. So another thing I have to introduce here is before we really go to applications is the lift. So sometimes you try to solve this kind of linear system with polynomials alpha one to alpha k. Okay. 
but the right hand side is not zero. It's also some kind of vector. So this one is not a CCG problem. It's a very similar to CCG problem. It's an inhomogeneous CCG problem. You can roughly say something like this. So this one, this question is called a lift problem. So it's a very similar to a linear algebra. So if we try to solve this inhomogeneous problem, we just need to find the one particular solution, okay, to solve this equation. And then we find all the homogeneous solution, which are all CCGs. So one particular solution plus a CCG will give you all the solution for this one. So this is, this is called lift problem. How do you find the one solution? That's very easy. You calculate the group basis of this F1 to Fk, and then using this kind of uh, membership criteria, divide this one by the group basis. If the remainder is zero, then you'll say, okay, the solution really exists and we can really find the one solution. And then plus all this kind of CCG relation, get all the solutions. You don't need to do this kind of uh, lift for by yourself because uh, again, everything is uh, in this interface. So you have this kind of inhomogeneous problem. So let's talk about the lift for ideas that is even simpler than the vector than the module. Now you have this kind of four equations in three variables. We know it's very likely that there's no common solution. And actually that is, you calculate the group of basis, you find group of basis one. So by this, uh, uh, actually this, this is here, here but this weak uh, long-standing sense. That means uh, if there's no common solution, the group of basis must be one here. But this one is a purely mathematical argument. You don't know why this one should appear here. You just say, okay, I get one. Sometimes you want to say, how do I combine these four polynomials together to get this number one? You may think that it's a very easy question, but actually it's not such an easy question uh, because uh, it's quite, quite easy to solve it with a uh, linear algebra, but then the solution is kind of call factors. They are not polynomials, they are rational functions, that's uh, bad. So here you can use a singular lift. There's a lift command here. You put this idea, you put this one, and then you want to lift uh, this one as some kind of a linear combination in this idea. This one can be easily done, less than one second, because this kind of results. These four vectors, they are the cofactors. So if you take this kind of inner product of these four vectors, with the idea of magically get a one. So this is quite useful because sometimes you say you get a polynomial um, equation system, but you find there's no solution. But then you want to say, okay, where is the contradiction in the system? That is, you must combine several of them to get a one, then you just use leave to say, okay, maybe I combine this four, I get a one, I say, okay, this four are bad. So this is a quite a trivial example if you do lift for the idea. So here I give you a less trivial example. You can do this kind of, uh, this kind of lift for polynomial division, both CCG and the lift, these two tools together. So again, we try to do this kind of polynomial division. I have this kind of D1 to D3. So they are all uh, this kind of bivariant polynomials. So I have this N here x, y to the fourth. So if you consider this kind of problem, you want to make this kind of reminder as short as possible or as lower degree as possible. And also you want to simplify this kind of fi. So first, if you don't know this kind of computational algebra geometry, if you try to do it, just do this kind of point of reduce with mathematic then you find that actually the, the remainder is x, okay? You may think that the x is already much, much simpler than this input numerator. It seems it's quite good, okay? But uh, still it's not good because we can prove this remainder could be just, just zero, okay? So let's do it with group of basis. So again, we use this kind of interface to get a group of basis. You can find the group of basis just y and x for these two for these three complicated polynomials. <laughs> that implies that 
since the input polynomial is x to y false, so it's proportional to x, it's proportional to y, so that means the remainder must be zero, okay? So we don't need this delta, we can move everything to this kind of three terms combined together. <coughs> so we get a group of bases, but sometimes we want to convert this group of bases back to the idea we want to say, how does the group of bases element generated by the original bad generators? So this one can be done with lift. Actually, it's not a good practice. So if you use other kind of package or other kind of software like Maple, then Maple can directly give you this kind of converting matrix between the idea and the group of bases. So here we do one step more. We use this kind of lift to get it. So you do this kind of lift, then you find this kind of conversion matrix, okay, from the, the group of bases to the original generating set. And then you can see this conversion matrix, okay, <laughs> multiplied by the original bad generators will give you group of bases. The other way around is much easier, okay. If you really say, I want to say, how does the this kind of idea, this kind of bad generators generated by the uh, group of bases. That is easy, it's just to do one point of division is done, but the other way you need a lift. <laughs> now here, you see, we get this reminder must be zero, no doubt about that. But uh, for this kind of F, this kind of quotients or cofactors, you need to divide by the group of bases, get the quotients about the uh, group of bases, but then you have to convert it back to the original convention to this kind of bad generators. That's easy, you just do this kind of polynomial, uh, this kind of vector, this is a vector, times this matrix and so down. But uh, unfortunately, it's a very high degree. You may say that it's okay because the input is degree five. Now, of course, this kind of F1, F2, F3, that be some high degree. Uh, polynomials, okay, let's just keep it here. But then think of the real application. If you try to do it for like an integrand reduction, or if you have some amplitude, one, you want to simplify a fraction. So in this case, if you have this kind of F1, F2, F3, with some quite a high degree polynomial, then it's still very, not very nice. But until result, it looks quite, quite messy. And if you try to work with the numerics and then this kind of high degree things is not something that is stable to use. <laughs> so we can use this kind of CCG method to do it even better. So you see here we have this kind of uh, quotients about these three generators. But we know, okay, there would be some kind of long trivial relations, this F1, D1 plus F2, D2 plus F3, D3, just zero. These are CCGs. This kind of CCGs, you feel free to add it to, add it to here, okay? You still get uh, the correct quotient. So quotient is not uh, uniquely defined. You can always divide this quotient vector by the CCG vector. So let's do it. So we have this kind of ideas and get the CCG, the relation between the three polynomials. And then I get the group of basis of the CCG. So we have this kind of quotient. It's not so nice. Okay, that's a degree four, degree five, is it highest degree five? It's not something so nice. But divide by the CCG, you can find that, okay, that's all reduced to degree two polynomials. So this is the final answer. So by doing this, okay, we use the both group basis to get uh, the simplest delta, but then we divide by the CCG to get uh, the uh, simplest F1, F2, F3 to get a nice decomposition. So you can think that possibly we are doing some kind of uh, integrand decomposition. Okay, so we have this n divided by d1, d2, d3, but then you can say since delta is zero, so the three denominator term is gone. We only have this kind of two denominator terms. But for the new uh, two denominator terms, this F, this new numerator only has a degree two. That's a great improvement because the degree reduced from five to two. That means the result is much, much simpler. So this simple example has a lot of applications for simplifying the antiple results in uh, amplitudes. For example, uh, 
like our recent work with my colleagues. So we say IBP reduction coefficients made simple. We find that first you do the IBP reduction and then you convert the IBP reduction coefficients to a UT basis, if you have a UT basis, to a UT basis. But still you get a huge coefficients in front of this kind of UT integrals. <laughs> but then you do this kind of partial fraction with this one, this kind of uh, polynomial division over group basis, and then divide the quotients by the sausages. And then you use the traditional uh, nine times algorithm, combine these two things together, you can find that uh, something magic would happen. In some cases, this uh, kind of algorithm can simplify the analytical results by a factor of 100, it is not just, over, just a factor of 10. So that means uh, sometimes people complain that uh, you get the antigo result, but the antigo result is too long, very, very difficult to use. Even from this kind of very huge antigo result, you can't get a numerical result fast enough. But with this method, now it's possible because you can simplify this huge fraction by all this kind of algebraic geometry method. So let's talk about another kind of application. So they are all uh, from theory um, applications. So this, this one is about uh, the uniformly transcendental ways Feynman integrals. So actually it's a topic from Kurt Duhr's lecture. So the issue here is, okay, you know, there are many, many different ways to find the UT integrals, but for this kind of cutting edge problems, still it's not so easy to get UT integrals. I show you one cutting edge problem. There's a two loop method, it's a long plan, actually it's a long plan diagram, five point. If you try to find the UT integral, actually it's quite, quite tough. So here we present our method to find the UT in this paper with the, uh, Johannes Hair and the Thomas Gellman's group. So the way to find the UT for this particular diagram is uh, the so-called the lift method. So why this one is difficult? It's difficult because you have five minus down variables here. And uh, also you have this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, trace five, this so-called uh, uh, the square root of the gram determinant, which is a parity order term in the kinematics. Also this one is difficult because the long-term diagram, this sector itself has nine mass integrals. So just for this particular sector, you need the nine uh, UT integrals. That's quite difficult. So we try some kind of a traditional method that doesn't work. So for example, you must have heard that people said that the 4D leading singularity constant integrals would be candidates for the UT integral. But this one is definitely is a count example. You can easily find some 4D leading singularity constant integrals, but they are not UT integral. Also, some people said that the 4D D log integral, if you rewrite the 4D formal integral and rewrite this thing as a D log, it's be UT. Again, this one is a count example. This one is not. Okay. So here the situation is you have to extend it a little bit. You have to go directly, okay, before you do the integration. So for this kind of residue, this a residue computation or D log analysis, you have to go to the Baikov uh, representation, introduce this four minus epsilon in the beginning, okay, not in the end, and then do the analysis. But again, it's complicated. So here we make some kind of answers. So the key is for top sector five point Feynman integrals, the UT integral will be something like this. Some constant CI, actually it's not just a constant, it's some kind of polynomial in the Mendelstam variables or a polynomial divided by this trace five, this uh, square root of a gram determinant. So these are coefficients and this AI, that will be some kind of normal Feynman integrals. It's a Feynman integrals with a, uh, some ordinary ISPs to some power. The power shouldn't be very, very high. You have to make sure that for each subloop, there's no UV divergence. And you have to make sure there's no double propagate. Okay. So this is the answers. So the key here is, okay, you may heard that, okay, uh, you want to make an answers with some kind of master integrals and try to determine C to make it a UT. Actually, it's not the best way. The best way is you list all the possible uh, integrals here, okay, as long as you don't have a local UV divergence, no double propagator. 
So the reason for that is if you make this kind of answers, make the basis larger, don't use the master integrals, but make all the, add all the possible uh, good Feynman integrals here, then you would find that you eventually get a very simple solution in this kind of CI. If you, in the beginning, introduce the concept of the master integral, and then try to determine this kind of CI to make it uh, some kinds of uh, UT integral, then it's a very difficult computation because uh, if this AI is a master integral expansion, the CI would be huge, very complicated. But if you add some kind of flexibility, you use some redundant basis, then CI would be something very, very simple. Okay, but eventually they would be uh, equivalent. But uh, if you use a redundant basis to find a UT, actually it's better than if you use uh, this kind of uh, minimal master integral basis. Okay, so let's extend this kind of residue analysis to D dimension, not a four dimension. Okay, you have to consider this kind of bike of or whatever, or maybe Feynman representation to introduce this four minus epsilon, this epsilon in the beginning. Then you can find this, some points you have this kind of multi-residues. So the criteria here is so I have this kind of answers. I want the, on each kind of point, this residue is a constant. So constant here, I mean either zero or one, actually could also be minus one. This kind of simple constant numbers. So this is my, equation for getting the UT integrals. And I expect the CI would be extremely simple. Even for this complicated diagram, I require the CI be extremely simple, should be polynom either polynomials in the Mendelstam variable, or polynomial divided by this square roots. So this one will give you an even UT. So this one will give you all the UT. And you see, let's forget about this epsilon five for a while. Okay. Let's talk about the first case, even ut, then the ci is just a polynomial. This one with the two indices is i and alpha, so this is a matrix. So by some careful treatment of this matrix, you can move all this kind of poles to this b side. So the b, suppose you want it to be uh, the first entry one, all the other entries zero, then you can multiply by the post, the B will become some kind of known vector with polynomial entries. And this is a polynomial matrix. Then you try to find this kind of polynomial vector solution. This one is a typical lift problem. And then here I didn't list this matrix because this matrix, uh, although I simplified a lot, but still is quite hard, huge. I didn't list the matrix, but if you are interested, uh, I can send you a copy of this matrix. So for this residue matrix multiplied by some kind of cofactor CI equals another simple vector BI. So I can put it to singular with singular lift, I determine this kind of CI. So here I choose a redundant basis. It's very, very important that you don't use mass in group basis. It's a counterintuitive, okay? You have to use uh, this kind of redundant basis to do this kind of UT search. <laughs> So I put this kind of CI, okay, something I had to solve. This one, this is a normalized residue matrix is known. I put some kind of denominator, actually this kind of pose in this matrix to here, okay. So everything here is uh, just a polynomial in five minus one variables. I ask a singular lift to solve for it. In less than one second, I get a solution like this, okay. This is extremely fast. The good thing is uh, all these kind of coefficients are extremely simple, extremely simple. They are not just the polynomials, they are low degree polynomials with at most only two monomials inside. So very simple, that's a good sign. So here it is, uh, if you work on this kind of UT integral search, even if you are working with something extremely complicated diagram, long time diagram, high loop, high multiplicity, top top sector, so the experience is if you use a redundant basis to, ex uh, to expand it, then it's very likely that the UT integral has a very simple expansion like this. But if you use a mass integral to expand that, then unfortunately you get a huge, huge coefficients in front. Okay. Even sometimes you couldn't uh, find the coefficients, it's too complicated. 
So again, then I can change this B a little bit. I can change it like this is one minus one. I can change it to be one minus one here. I just uh, by hand or automatically change this B input. We can get all the UTs in the sectors. So this is an elegant way to get the UT for the very complicated top sector. Now, of course, if you work with some simple UT problem, you don't need this kind of techniques. You don't need this kind of D-dimensional residue. You just do everything, the 4D residue or 4D D log, you get everything. But remember, if you have something as complicated as this one or more complicated, and if you work with the top sector, then you may think that, remember, the top sector UT usually would be some kind of very simple coefficients times some kind of redundant finite integrals. This is a nice form of the UT. If you run IBP, get it to this kind of master integrals, then these coefficients will really huge, but this is cheating. I think this is a nice representation of the UT. Okay, but of course, it's only for the cutting edge problem. You need such kind of technical method to get the result. Okay. Okay, so this is a research example like why this kind of module is useful, why this kind of inhomogeneous CCG is useful. So let's turn to our project. So I give you some hints on the project from this kind of wonderful diagram. So let's talk about this kind of uh, one loop IBP reduction of the triangle diagram. Of course, it's a trivial question with the light red file cure, and it's not a problem or at all. But let's do some kind of inside engineering to say, okay, so how could we improve the Laporta algorithm? So here you say, I have this message dot box. I choose this particular one 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 zero sector. So it's a triangle. <laughs> So of course, if you use the Laporta algorithm from this sector, then you get a double propagated here, here, or here. Then you get some kind of double propagated intervals. That's not very good. Okay, of course, you can do Laporta algorithm Gaussian emission to get rid of it. But suppose that my input is integral, just this one without double propagated. Just let me know how can I reduce it. You know the answer. This integral, suppose there's no double propagator. Or even with double propagate, it's always reduced to a bubble integral. But if you use Napata, then you have to somehow further generate all this kind of double propagate integrals, or even triple propagate integrals. Combine all this kind of IP together, and then do the Gaussian emulation to get this integral actually is a bubble. <coughs> so let's do some kind of CCG computation to get the IBP. We tell me try this V as a a1, A2, A3, and A4 multiplied by these vectors. So there are uh, four independent vectors in the question. We choose P1, P2, P4, and L. We don't use P3 because the P3 would be linearly dependent. It's not needed. So we want this kind of CCG relation for each of this kind of denominator D1, D2, D3. We want IBP without the increase the power of D1, D2, D3. So we have this kind of equation. So there are actually three equations. I mean, R equals one, two, three. So we can rewrite this thing as a matrix three times seven matrix. So this A1, A2, A3, A4, of course, there's some kind of parameters in this particular direction of V. It's not known. We want to find them. But also, this call factor is not known either. You want to find them. So it's a three by seven matrix. You want to find the long space of it. It's a y equals zero. <coughs> However, you want this a and b would be polynomials in L, because if you have something L in the denominator, then the issue is you are introducing new denominator in the system. It's not a good IBP without double profit. So here. From the Lorentz symmetry, you want uh, this kind of A and Bs. They are polynomials in these four free variables. You can think these variables are independent free variables. You'd better give them some name, like the x1, x2, x3, x4, something like that. <laughs> so this one, A times Y equals zero is a linear equation, but you want the solution to be a polynomial in this kind of 
um, this kind of invariance. So this is a Sicily equation. It's not a linear algebra equation. Remember, you can solve this one easily by singular. But uh, I have to say that be careful. Okay? It's always confusing. Like, uh, should I take uh, this kind of vector product from right or from left? So here I draw this picture like this. But inside the interface, you have to make sure that okay, whether it's the multiplication from left or from right, you should do some experiments by yourself. So I solve this kind of CCG equation. It seems like I get six CCG generators. Actually, you can easily say I can do some kind of trimming algorithm to get rid of some of the generators. Okay. But here I just look at the one generator. For one generator, it looks like this. So this kind of A, they are already known here. Okay, they are already known here. This are the A's. So from this one, I put it back to the IBP. So I got some IBP like this. It looks very, very messy. It seems even worse than the original Napoleon algorithm get the fundamental IBP and then do a seeding here. But as I said, the good thing is, uh, although it looks quite, quite random in terms, but uh, for M1, like the first entry M1, this is M1, 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 M1 minus one, M1. So I never, I never increase the power of M1. So that means I never increase the degree of the first denominator. And if I start from M1 equals one, I should never get a double propagate. That's the same argument for M2 and M3. And from the seeding, okay, the seeding is very important. I'm sure you learned this kind of seeding thing, maybe from Ben Page's lecture or Cardo's lecture. So here, this is still this is quite a formal IBP. This is valid for any kind of M. So let's do a seeding. Let's put a seed if this M equals to one, 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 zero. That's a target diagram. I put it here. Then I can see I simplify it to get a very simple result. This one is uh, the triangle G1110. This one is a bubble. Okay, this is a bubble. That one actually is not a bubble. This one is a zero integral. If you draw the picture clearly, you see this one is integrated to zero. So this term, the middle term should be dropped. And then you find that this triangle is immediately reduced to the bubble. I didn't do any kind of Laporta Gaussian relation. Okay. So the price I paid is I used this kind of CCG method to generate some special IBPs. But as long as, as I can generate this kind of IBPs, then I put it to the derivatives. That's a, I get a very direct, very simple IBPs. Then the Gaussian relation will be um, simple, but you have to somehow control the computational time. So for the real kind of computation, the thing is maybe you do three loop, or if you do two loop with many, many mass scales, you don't want to spend a lot of time on this kind of strategy computation. You always try to do this kind of strategy. Try to say, I do this kind of strategy computation with a minimal amount of time, maybe just inside one hour, even for research problem or in one hour. If it doesn't finish, you put some degree bound on it. Degree bound equals four, equals five, equals six, or whatever. Just make sure it can finish in one hour. And then you get a result. And then you put the finite field numbers, do this kind of finite field matrix elimination, trying to see if you get enough IBPs. In most of the cases, if you put a degree five, you get enough IBPs. You don't need to wait for singular to do the full city computation, wait for a day, a month to finish. That's wrong. Okay. In most of the cases, if you put a degree bound five, maybe just in one hour or even just several minutes, you get all these kind of CCGs you need. But of course, for the one loop computation, I didn't put any kind of degree bound. Still, it's finished very, very quick. Actually, no time was cost. For the project, you are asked to do this kind of two loop double box. Again, you don't need degree bound. You just ask a singular. Singular can do it just within one second to get the CCG. So you don't need to worry about this, the CCG running time. Another thing is uh, sometimes people get scared if you have too many uh, CCG generators here. So the thing here is uh, I ask you, if you want, I ask you for the, to read this uh, 
classical paper by David Kosovo and his colleagues about how to trim the system. You can say some of the generators are not really needed. Or if, if you can use some other kind of system, you can use, uh, for example, like uh, Macaulay 2 or Maple or something, try to find a minimal generating set for it. But I would say, for the practical purpose, nowadays, this kind of uh, finite field method is so powerful. So why, why not? If you have six sausages, I just say for each kind of uh, sausage, I do a sitting up to some kind of power. For example, this could be 1110, 111 minus 1, 111 minus 2, 111 minus 4, whatever, to a, a finite sitting. Then sometimes I get a huge IBG system, but uh, I put everything as ST and dimension D as some finite field, random numbers. Just with a finite field, I think very, very quickly, I can find the independent IBPs without double propagator. Then I don't need to trim, really trim this kind of singular output of CCG. Even I get 100 CCG, I don't worry about that. I say I get a huge IBG system, but I don't solve the IBG system. I put the finite field numbers numerically, I can determine uh, how many, uh, equations are independent. So this is a part of the project. Okay, so for this uh, trivial example, I can say I use the CCG, I find a very, very uh, sharp, I just the one IPP to reduce this triangle to bubble. Here I didn't use uh, any kind of Gaussian elimination because uh, usually if you do this kind of CCG, this uh, Laporta system becomes much, much shorter and you get some very, very direct IBP from the target to the master, minimal master integral like this. But still, of course, it's two loops, three loops. You definitely still need to do some kind of Gaussian elimination, but it's a small scale Laporta computation. Okay, like this kind of project, you still need to do some kind of Laporta, but for each Laporta, each sector is just 200 something integrals or maybe 100. And even mathematical can do this kind of thing. You don't need to call file or Kira format, all this kind of thing. Just mathematical can do this kind of Gaussian emission for you. That's so quite easy. <laughs> so in summary, if you try to use CCG to IBP, you get uh, the CCG relation for all the non-zero sectors. It's quite, quite easy to determine which sector is non-zero from the Feynman parameterization. And uh, for each sector, each CCG generator, compute the generic IB. So what is generic IBP? I mean, I don't put any number in this kind of indices. I just say M1, M2, M3, M4, so the generic IBP. But then, okay, do a seeding. For this one, I use the one seed, but here you can put the other kind of integers, one, 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 minus one, 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 minus two. But of course the seeding should be consistent with this sector. You can't say I, for this sector, I use a seed one, 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 one. Okay, but that's a seed for the top sector, for the box sector, okay. So suppose you don't want to trim this kind of CCG generator, then you collect the IPP relation, and then you set up an integral ordering. So here you can say, I get this kind of IPPs, I set an integral ordering, so then I should get a matrix. So first put in some kind of finite field numbers, uh, then you can check the rank of the matrix by some linear algebra and see how many IBPs are really linearly independent. Then you do a Gaussian elimination for the independent ones, reduce the integrals to the mass integrals on that sector. Then you have some kind of tails, but tails you can do the recursive like Laporta, put it uh, to the lower sectors and uh, repeat this process. <laughs> I will say some kind of new development along this direction. So sometimes actually it's not uh, that easy to calculate the CCG with that kind of variable. So uh, somehow we invented this method to do the thing with the Baikov variables. It's uh, somehow easier. So in this one, this is a Baikov representation. The so Baikov representation is the duality of the Feynman representation. So Feynman representation has this kind of monomials upstairs. We have this kind of Baikov variables downstairs. So we have the two derivative equals zero. So this is uh, absolutely correct. So Feynman parameterization, you do IBP. Then you have boundary terms. Okay. But for Baikov, definitely don't have boundary terms. It's very good. And with this kind of form, 
you can do any kind of utility cost easily. So in most of the cases for the hard problem, we don't do the IPP. Uh, in one step, we consider different kind of spanning cards. So spanning cards make sure that we are not missing any kind of miss mass intervals. So we do this kind of utility cards. We put several of these to zero, and then this F gets much simpler, and then we get the CCG much easier. We get this kind of IBP much easier to solve. So we divide and compare the problem by spanning cards. So in this case, we have two requirements. One is in Bikoff, just like this kind of Lipomaransky case, we want to avoid any kind of shift for the dimension. So there's one CCG relation like this, but there's also, say, suppose I don't want the propagate degree increase, or say we don't have double propagate, then we can say this AI, this AI is proportional to one of this ZI. Okay, so we have this kind of things. Then it seems that we have a lot of CCG equation to solve, but the back of um, coordinates, it looks very simple because this one, okay, so this one looks complicated, but you saw this F, this back of kernel. So this one is a symmetric matrix determinant. So this one by a Laplace expansion of it, easily can find all this kind of R, this AJ and the beta. So this CCG equation easily solved by that one. That one is a trivial one. It just means AI is proportional to CI. So this is also solved. But then you see, I just needed to find the intersection, this M1 and M2, okay. And uh, then if you can find the intersection, then you get it. But you may worry about, it seems I still have CCG to solve because to find the M1, M2, you need a CCG. Uh, yeah, it's right. Because if you want the M1, M2 intersection, you can use the standard algorithm that's a CCG algorithm. You still have to do some CCG. But thing here is actually we didn't use this algorithm, it's something else. So thing is since M1, M2, they are quite a simple submodules. We can define some special uh, ordering of these uh, modules and do some kind of auxiliary extension of the modules as some trick to convert this kind of CCG computations to a group of basis computation in an extended module and do group of basis. Then we find the intersection. It's better to really do this kind of intersection with a standard method. So there's some way to get the CCG easier than using the standard momentum representation. Okay. So I think it's uh, almost the time. I think I already talked for three lectures. So let me summarize what I said. So I would say it's quite tough. I, I would say it's a quite, quite a difficult task for students this time to understand, okay, the computational algebra geometry in just three lectures. And I have to also mention that I gave a lot of examples and I asked you to install some softwares. I also gave you some kind of projects you need to do a lot of computations. So it's really, really quite a tough task to understand all the concepts and really uh, understand the computation, install the software useful and also do some real computations. But I hope if you don't understand, okay, everything I said this time, please keep my slides somewhere. So in the future, if you find some of the questions, okay, the question about the polynomials or vector of the polynomials or the fractions, polynomial or polynomials, Suppose it's a question, one, you want a special solution, the solution must be polynomials, this kind of things. Or sometimes you have a huge algebraic equation system, like the scattering equation system, like a beta answer system. I hope somehow you keep my slide somewhere in my computer. And also uh, in the future, if you see this kind of problems, take a look of my slides and try to find a reference try to find some computational algebraic geometry method. And then you can maybe really solve some kind of research problem. So I, I would say this kind of computational algebraic geometry, of course, is a very generic thing. But I find that uh, uh, it's very, very useful for some hardcore problem, like this kind of two loop five point, UT non-planar UT integral search, this kind of cutting edge problem. Okay. It can really, simplify things dramatically. So I introduced the computational algebra geometry with the application for the new IBP algorithm for the UT integral searching for the 
analytic result simplification by the polynomial division by the CCG reduction. I also briefly introduced that if you have a multivariant algebraic system with a zero dimensional solutions, so what can you do? Sometimes you can still find identical solutions. And of course, uh, this computational algebra jump itself is developing, is getting more and more popular, more and more applications. Also outside the theoretical physics, okay. Uh, in theoretical physics, it's useful also for string theory, for quantum many body theory, for the integrability. But of course, it's useful for other subjects of theoretical physics. So I think I finished all of my three lectures here. And I thanks, thanks a lot for your patience for this quite a tough subjects. And I hope you really learned something from my lectures. And uh, I wish you can get some benefits from doing my projects. If you still have some kind of projects about, uh, uh, well, I, has, I can answer some of them the questions about my lectures, but if you still have some questions, detailed questions about projects, you can ask me online from the Slack. Thanks. Let's uh, first of all give uh, Yang a, a round of applause for the three lectures.